Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for watching and for attending. And my thanks, of course, to the Dark Archives team for inviting me. I hope you are all well and that you and your loved ones are safe. During these last few months, I've taken great comfort in the endurance of medieval manuscripts. I know, I know, untold numbers haven't survived. They've been burnt, chewed, dampened, dismembered, and lost forever. But those that have survived, they are testaments to human intellect, artistry, and craft, not to mention their own resilience, even those that are fragments of their original selves. I've found real peace in imagining, visualizing the manuscripts I know and love lying quietly in, a cool, in the cool, dark, dry stacks of the library, underground, safe in their cases and boxes and cozy nests of acid-free tissue. Up here on the surface, things have been pretty bad. Illness, death, financial precarity, unemployment, isolation, civic unrest, violence, political upheaval, and let's not forget about the murder hornets. Through it all, the manuscripts lie in the dark, waiting. They can wait for centuries if they must for the touch of human hands and the regard of human eyes. They don't mind the quiet and they don't mind the dark. I have been many things over the course of my career as a medievalist, freelance manuscript cataloger, adjunct professor of library science, administrator, blogger, paleographer, codicologist, fragmentologist. Wait, what was that? What was that last one? Fragmentologist an invented word, a Frankenstein combination of a Latin root and a Greek suffix. A word I heard for the first time in 2013 at a meeting in Geneva, convened to discuss the status and future of the study of medieval manuscript fragments. At the time, each of the participants was asked to introduce themselves and say something about their background and scholarship. I introduced myself as a paleographer and a codicologist, but by the end of the meeting, I identified myself without hesitation as a fragmentologist. As it turned out, I had already been a fragmentologist for 25 years. I just hadn't had a name for it. Flashback to 1989, my second year of graduate school at Yale, the year I began working for the Beinecke Library's curator of pre-1600 manuscripts, Robert Babcock, as his graduate student assistant. In addition to standard student responsibilities, such as photocopying and tracking down books and articles, I was given what would turn out to be a life-changing assignment. Dr. Babcock sat me down in front of two enormous boxes of manuscript fragments and put me to work on their conservation and cataloging. The project would occupy me for several years and set us both off on a great adventure that would result in an exhibition, several collaborative publications, a few articles, my dissertation, and my first monograph. Unlike the single leaves I often blog or tweet about, these fragments, now known collectively as Beinecke Manuscript 481 and 482, were not the victims of 20th century greed-induced bibliocasm, but rather the byproducts of necessary medieval and early modern recycling and reuse. Parchment being a valuable resource, it was quite common in the early modern period for out-of-date or damaged medieval codices to be dismantled for use as binding scrap in late medieval and early modern bindings. Paste downs, fly leaves, binding stays or wraparounds. Over the course of the Beinecke project, I learned how to interpret medieval evidence to distinguish different layers of use. Sewing holes from the original manuscript, scars left by the binder's knife, annotations written by readers of the bound book, the tape residue from a modern book dealer. I was trained on the job in the basics of parchment conservation carefully removing the fragments from the acidic mats into which they had been scotch taped, making basic repairs in Yale's conservation lab using Japanese tissue and a water-based paste, and housing the leaves in custom mylar sheaths stored in archival folders 
and boxes. And of course, I cataloged them, working with several other students under Dr. Babcock's supervision. That work later became volume four of the Beinecke's published catalog. Over the course of the project, this 12th century antiphonal caught my eye. There were 17 leaves at Yale, and I found myself drawn to its elaborate and graceful initials, the unheightened neumes, and the system of marginal tonary letters, as well as its codicological features and the intellectual and liturgical challenge posed by the task of putting the leaves in the correct order. The story of how we traced this manuscript and dozens of other Yale fragments to their medieval origin at the Austrian Benedictine Abbey in Lambach has been told elsewhere. Suffice to say that we identified the artist and scribe of the antiphonal as this handsome fellow who signed himself Gottschalk of Lambach in a manuscript written and decorated by the same hand. Hence, we christened the fragmentary manuscript the Gottschalk Antiphonal. In addition to the 17 antiphonal leaves at Yale, there were two at Harvard's Houghton Library, one that toured the Midwestern United States in an aluminum trailer in the 1950s before settling down at the St. Louis Public Library, and a few still in Austria, in the Abbey of St. Paul in Laventhal, a resort hotel in Bad Gerstein, and in Lombok itself. Although the incunable fly leaves observed there as recently as 1998 have since unfortunately vanished and are known only in my black and white photographs. I don't even have the negatives anymore, <clears throat> just contact sheets. In 2016, though, an offset of a leaf of the Gottschalk Antiphonal was found in an incunable belonging to the Beinecke Library, discovered and imaged by then grad student, but now Indiana University professor Elizabeth Hebbard. The mirror image remnant was left behind when the actual leaf was peeled off of the wooden board, where it had been used to secure the leather turn-ins on the back cover. Ironically, the volume had been at the Beinecke Library for decades, by the time I wrote my thesis there in the 90s, but it was only during a recent survey of the bindings by Dr. Hebbard that the offset was photographed and identified. Inverted and rotated, it is perfectly legible and easily identifiable as a now lost leaf of the Gottschalk Antiphonal. When I first studied the Gottschalk Antiphonal in the early 1990s, I did it with scissors and paste and black and white photographs and photocopies on the floor of my living room. Things have changed since then. What can we do now that we couldn't do 25 years ago? Quite a lot. Here's what the facsimile of the Gottschalk Antiphonal looks like in my dissertation. The published book was not a great improvement, but here's how the leaf looks with today's imaging standards. We can definitely do better now than we could then. Let's talk about ecology. As part of my work on the Gottschalk Antiphonal, I partially reconstructed several choirs using these hand-drawn schematics. I assigned each leaf an invented folio number based on its choir and place within that choir. Choir 3, for example, was comprised of a Yale bifolium and the two bifolia currently, uh, formerly I should say, in the incunable at Lombach, the bifolia that are now lost. This is a very nice visualization that thanks to the University of Pennsylvania's Dot Porter and her VizCol application, we can do a lot better. Now we can see the structure, the bifolia, and their relationships to one another in a single visualization. And we can go even further. Using IIIF compliant images in a shared canvas viewer such as Mirador, we can actually start digitally reconstructing manuscripts like the Gottschalk Antiphonal, pulling images from disparate collections into a shared space where they can be rearranged and annotated and studied in an interface that is far from static and avoids the pitfalls of siloing. IIIF, the International Image Interoperability Framework, is a way of presenting digital images in an online environment that allows them to be shared via a persistent URL instead of by downloading and uploading into a silo. There's more to it than that, of course, but that's the basic idea. In other words, if an online image is IIIF compliant, 
It can be manifested in a workspace known as a shared canvas simply by pointing to the IIIF URL. The image is drawn into the shared canvas when called for rather than being physically stored there. This interoperability has the advantage of enabling a user to apply their own metadata and annotations and sequence the images without transforming the actual image file. An image can be stored in one place while being used in multiple, <clears throat> multiple workspaces. The model is completely open access and avoids siloing and is thus in keeping with digital best practices. So let me hop over to the internet and I will show you how IIIF makes uh, digital fragmentology possible. So this is uh, a leaf of the Gottschalk and Tiffinol at Harvard at the Houghton Library. The embedded shared canvas viewer, and there you can see the metadata below, that the embedded shared canvas viewer uh, has multi-slot functionality. So clicking here, I can add a space to the right, and then I can, let's close that, I can actually start adding other items to compare. So this is uh, the IIIF manifest of one of the leaves that belongs to Yale. If I copy that and I come back here and you add it, add the URL, and there it is. Now, now we have two leaves that we can put side by side and we can zoom and we can compare. But well, I don't know, let's add a third. Why not? So over here, we have uh, another leaf. This is the leaf at the St. Louis Public Library, and I can add it as well using the same procedure. There we go. So now we have three leaves in a row that we can compare uh, and contrast, and we can look at the text. And so now um, it should be pretty clear to you how IIIF functionality um, allows you not only to bring, um, to bring images together in the same shared space, but we can actually now start digitally reconstructing uh, manuscripts that have been dismembered. The result of the um, conference in Geneva was the launch of a um, resource called fragmentarium.ms a workspace for cataloging fragments and creating virtual reconstructions of parent manuscripts. Fragmentarium takes advantage of IIIF functionality to easily allow users to upload, catalog, and arrange leaves to create digital reconstructions uh, like this one, a reconstruction of a book of hours that my students at the Simmons University School of Library and Information Science did. I'm using Fragmentarium in my own work, reconstructing the Bovey Missal, a late 13th century manuscript broken by Otto Eggy in 1942. And last year, I used Fragmentarium to digitally reconstruct the Gottschalk and Tiffinol. It was truly thrilling and a little bit uh, emotional for me <laughs> to see the manuscript rebuilt in glorious IIIF compliant color. I hope that more leaves will come to light someday. And if they do, they can easily be added to the 28 leaves that currently comprise the fragmentarium reconstruction. So why am I telling you all this? Because I did this work, digitally reconstructing the Gottschalk and Tiffinol from my home in 2019, pre-COVID. Before the pandemic forced us to all to work from home, Sitting on my couch in a Boston suburb, crafting metadata for images of fragments in Massachusetts, Connecticut, Missouri, an Alpine resort, and two Austrian Benedictine abbeys, entering metadata and uploading or mirroring images into a server in Switzerland, I was already doing fragmentology from my living room. Digital fragmentology is, by definition, a socially distant methodology. Given that you can be a digital fragmentologist in your pajamas, you might think that the present circumstance is a perfect and fertile environment for the growth and flourishing of digital fragmentology. In its most sophisticated form, digital fragmentology depends on interoperable digital images, taking advantage of interoperable platforms and frameworks to allow for the reuniting of fragments in a single shared digital space. 
fragments that may in reality be separated by thousands of miles. So that's one of several ways in which enforced lockdown has actually facilitated digital fragmentology, or more precisely, hasn't impeded it. Promotion of the field is another way. The enforced dependence on digital access during the pandemic lockdown has provided opportunities to promote and grow the field of digital fragmentology. We can't go to conferences. Many of us can't even leave our homes. So we enthusiastically turn to online conferences and lectures and discussions. A lecture I gave online about fragments and fragmentology in April was supposed to be in person at Stanford University for what would certainly have been a small and rather niche crowd. Online, there were several hundred attendees and recorded more than a thousand views. Lectures delivered online by my colleagues have shown similar numbers. And it's not just about Zoom and YouTube. Medieval Twitter during lockdown, for me at least, has become a true community of like-minded scholars posing questions, posting interesting images, engaging in crowdsourced debate and problem solving, sharing bibliography and touching base just to make sure everybody's okay. Just last week, Stephanie Leahy posted images of this lovely leaf from the collection of Mount Royal University in Calgary. Kathleen Kennedy, expert on the English Books of Hours, commented that she thought it looked English, and I agreed. And Stephanie confirmed it was thought to be from Zion Abbey. Well, then I did a Google search, found a few more images, and reached out to Julia King, who's writing her dissertation on the Bridgetine books at Zion Alley, and so uh, Zion Abbey, and so on. A quick um, that made me think that perhaps Twitter fragmentology should be its own specialization. But of course, because the libraries have been closed, we've had no choice but to interact with our primary resources in a digital environment. For me, that means discovering and interacting with digitized fragment collections. My primary fragmentology focus is the biblioclastic legacy of Otto Frederick Egge. The Beauvais Missal is among his, the most well-known of the hundreds of manuscripts he broke in the 1930s and 40s and scattered throughout the Midwestern United States. I've located 111 leaves so far out of 308, but who's counting? I spent a lot of time during lockdown cataloging each of these leaves in Fragmentarium, uploading or mirroring images and putting them in sequence to digitally reconstruct the known portion of the manuscript. Of the 111 leaves, 26 are in private collections and 13 are unlocated, leaving 72 institutional collections in North America, England, France, Japan, and Australia. 24 of those are known only because of images I took during site visits. The other 48 have been professionally imaged and are hosted in institutional or consortial digital repositories. Of those, only nine are IIIF compliant and interoperable. Okay, I'm lying. That's not true at all. Now that I've loaded or mirrored all 111 into Fragmentarium, they are all IIIF compliant. When you create a Fragmentarium sequence, you get a IIIF manifest whether it's a sequence of two sides of one leaf or a sequence of 111 leaves. Whether public, unlocated, or private, shared with permission, all of these Beauvais missile leaves are now truly interoperable and can be mirrored into other shared canvas viewers. In fact, any collection that owns one of the leaves I photographed myself could use the Fragmentarium IIIF manifest to mirror the images into their own digital repository if they are themselves IIIF compliant. During the COVID lockdown, without access to institutional libraries and collections, we have had no choice but to become digital humanists, whether we wanted to or not. We're digging into data. We're searching for electronic versions of secondary sources. We're scouring the internet for images of primary source material 
images of medieval manuscripts. But in a COVID world, we are all digital medievalists. I say this with a caveat. With thanks to the generosity of curators and web gurus at several different institutions, I've gathered 2020 page view statistics for Parker on the Web, Fragmentarium, Ecodices, the Beinecke Library, and the British Library. Here is some of that data with 2019 in red and 2020 in blue. In each of these three repositories, there was a spike in usage in the spring at the beginning of lockdown, a spike that is even more dramatic when compared to the 2019 data. I would have expected a spike in the spring when everyone suddenly had to work from home and the library shut down. But what I did expect was to see usage drop as we moved into summer. It's not as if everyone suddenly went to the beach in July. Most of the world was on lockdown all summer. I'm guessing that after an initial burst of online enthusiasm, COVID fatigue took over or everyone got distracted with stress and worry and family and life and death and Zoom and Panopto and Moodle and whatever other platform we all suddenly had to learn how to use. This is of course hardly a representative survey and I'm no data analyst. But I suspect that, sick and tired of staring at a screen, we all just want to get back to the library, back to the manuscripts. And that we all includes library staff. They miss their manuscript babies. Just like the researchers, librarians want to get back to the library, where it's, when, of course, it's safe to do so. Digitization and development stopped when libraries closed in March and April, and is just now, in the US at least, beginning to restart. Projects that were underway stopped midstream. As simple as the digitization of single leaves is when compared to a bound codex, it doesn't just magically happen. It requires human facilitation. To demonstrate, here is none other than uh, Stanford University's Benjamin Albritton. <laughs> and uh, I think Joanne Tarakari, uh, Tarakani put it best. A person has to be in the room with the codex or with the fragment, pull the box from the shelf, remove the fragment from its housing, set it on the imaging platform, adjust the lighting and focus, balance the color, open the shutter, process the image. Someone else has to craft the metadata, and yet another staff member loads the image and records uh, and the record onto a server, making the record uh, and the image discoverable. COVID sent digitization specialists and data librarians home, depriving all of us of the necessary human contribution to the digitization and discovery of medieval manuscripts. The truth is, we can only access images of objects that had already been digitized before the lockdown. And we can only find images that had already been cataloged before the lockdown. And we can only share images that were already being served in interoperable formats before the lockdown. Our digital work is necessarily limited to images that exist and records that are discoverable. Our digital work is also limited by, well, the limits of the digital. In spite of advances in visualizations, imaging, and graphics, it is simply not possible, at least not yet, to capture every physical component of a manuscript, even a manuscript fragment in a digital image. Manuscripts, fragments, even scraggly little creatures like this one, are three-dimensional objects with a front and a back and a side. And they comprise much more than the words and the images on a flat surface. Some features of medieval manuscripts must be touched. Uh, they must be smelled and even heard in order for the observer to fully engage with and interpret them. Hear that? That is some thick parchment. And here's a much finer parchment. It sounds quite different. Let's do that again. 
they sound quite different. And of course they look different and they feel very different. The quality of the parchment, uh, you can really feel the difference when you have your fingers on it. In, um, in digital fragmentology in particular, it can be important to distinguish hair side from flesh side in order to reconstruct divided by folia, a feature that can often only be determined by touch. In this case, there is in fact a real tactile difference between the smooth flesh side and the slightly uh, rougher hair side. Digital imaging doesn't always capture all the pertinent features of a manuscript leaf, such as blind ruling, effaced inscriptions, or evidence of sewing holes. And most institutions are unable to invest in MSI, custom rate lighting, or other specialized imaging that might make this side of the leaf more legible, as opposed to that side. I recently purchased handheld ultraviolet and infrared lamps to try this out uh, and just sort of to experiment with uh, multispectral imaging on my own, just to see uh, how it would look uh, with, in fact, this particular leaf of mine. The results were interesting. Uh, ultraviolet made the effaced side um, slightly more legible and infrared actually made uh, the red ink fluoresce while the brown ink faded. So those are interesting, they're useful, uh, very useful examples for teaching, but I won't be giving up my day job and I will leave the digital imaging to the experts. And so I am thrilled to see that digitization projects are gearing up again. And then of course there are the thousands and thousands of manuscript fragments that haven't been imaged or cataloged at all. Many collections don't prioritize the imaging and cataloging of fragments, even though they're relatively easy to image. They can be compl complicated to catalog. In our work collecting cumulative data for pre-1600 European codices and fragments in North America, my colleague Melissa Conway and I identified more than 500 institutional collections holding around 20,000 codices and 25,000 leaves and fragments. This is not a COVID map. It is a heat map showing the distribution of manuscripts in the United States. The data is somewhat imprecise because different collections use different definitions and terminology. That lack of standardization is a librarian-esque conversation for another date. Back in 1997, when we first started collecting this data using postcards and snail mail, we asked collections about their cataloging status. Of the nearly 300 collections that reported holdings of manuscript fragments back in the late 1990s, 134 reported that their fragments were not cataloged at all, and about the same number reported some kind of electronic cataloging. The picture has certainly changed since then. Uh, although we haven't done a systematic follow-up survey. It is clear, even from my own digital explorations, that more and more collections are cataloging early codices, cuttings, and fragments, combining metadata and images in an institutional or consortial digital repository, or including manuscript records in their local OPAC. These records will eventually make their way into WorldCat or the Digital Public Library of America, where they may or may not be readily discoverable, depending on the structure of the data. Mark records without images can still be useful if they are well-crafted. Even if they aren't, you can still find what you're looking for if you know where to look. Because many records don't follow best practices, you have to be strategic about how you look for them. So let's uh, take a look and see how this might work. I'm gonna go now over to WorldCat. There we go. So for example, if I do a search in WorldCat for bovine missile and Latin, we're gonna find, uh, let's see, and then let's limit it to manuscripts. Well, there's one, two, three, four, five, six. So you've got a few there. I know there are a lot more than that. So let's try a different search. 
I happen to know that Eggie dated this manuscript quite precisely for absolutely no, uh, no reason to 1285 on the nose. So if you search for Missal Latin and 1285, we're gonna find some more. So here we find seven manuscripts uh, and I can tell this one is not a Bovey Missal leaf. That one is, that one is, that one is. So we find a few more that way, even without images. And then finally, if we look up Otto F. Eggy and Missal, we find a few more. So we've got 12 manuscripts uh, and these include the portfolio 50 original leaves from medieval manuscripts. And then if you do a search on that title, we're gonna find some more. So even without images, if you have a, um, if you have a, a solid strategy for how to engage with the metadata, you can find what you're looking for, but it isn't always, uh, it isn't always easy. You just have to be strategic about it. More, many institutions in the United States don't have anyone on staff who can identify and catalog pre-1600 manuscript fragments. And so some collections have elected to leave their fragments alone in a box until they can find someone to properly catalog them. But I'm here to tell you that you can and you should image them anyway. Post the images online anyway, even with a mere skeleton of data. All you really need is one piece of information, a locator of some kind, a shelf mark, a permanent identifier, and then perhaps a uh, tag medieval manuscript fragment just to get the discoverability started. Until we can get back to the libraries, there is much work to be done with images that have already been captured and uploaded with or without comprehensive metadata. There are thousands of medieval manuscript fragments already online and discoverable in dedicated resources such as Fragmentarium, in library and museum digital repositories, and in private spaces such as Flickr and Pinterest. There is always cataloging work to be done. There is always paleographical analysis and provenance research and the digital reunification of sister leaves to be done. There are discoveries to be made, and there are enough images out there to keep us all busy for a while at least. Images without metadata, metadata without images. Neither is the record we want. We are greedy little medievalists. We want all the data and all the images. We want them linked, discoverable, and interoperable. Unfortunately, we can't always get what we want. If there are no discoverable, interoperable images of what we want, then we have to wait. Wait for the libraries to open, for the digital specialists and metadata librarians to come back to work as long as they can do so safely. Wait for the security guards and curators and reference librarians to turn on the lights and wait for the manuscripts to come out of the dark. Thank you. I'm looking forward to the synchronous discussion session and the round table with my colleagues. I'll see you then.